So, my name is Gary Radburn, Director of AR and VR at Dell, and you've already probably ascertained the fact that I'm not from around here. I actually originate from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I currently am, hence the accent. So I've been, been there about seven years, haven't picked it up yet, but uh, I'll try to avoid y'all as we go through it. So anyway, as we go through, how are we going to transform through AR and VR? I'm going to try not to make this a product pitch. I, if, I, if I do start going into salesy mode, then stick a hand up and stop me. Um, but I'm really going to go through the positional reasons of why VR and AR are really going to start to help to transform the industry. We've seen a couple of good presentations already, as I've been sitting at the back there, um, which are really focusing on much of the same thing in the same ways. I'm going to try and package that in a slightly different way and then finish off with a video of where we're actually seeing the future and where we're seeing design inside of industry really going towards. So we think we're now at a turning point. We've had phase one, so the wave one was the destination computing, mainframes, going to desks, uh, going to tower PCs. You actually had to physically be at your desk uh, nine to five or however many hours you really worked. And then we went the wave two, which is the portable wave, the mobile wave. We can now take our work with us. We can now work from the beach, the coffee shop, you know, the fields outside, or whatever else. Yeah, we could actually take our work with us wherever we wanted to work from. Far more flexible. We're now calling wave three the immersive wave. This is where we're starting to get VR and AR becoming everyday parts of our working life. Now, there's, there's a thing with VR, which I, I don't know how it came about, but VR and AR are very, very exciting. And sometimes I find that when people put on a VR headset, the light enters the eyes and the common sense comes out the ears. Right? They suddenly think that they can transform their entire workflow into a VR headset to sit there for eight hours a day to actually do their work and then take it off at the end and go home and whatever else. That's clearly not the case of where we are today. We're on a journey. You know, the technology today does have limitations in terms of what it can do. And to be honest, 80% of your workflow still remains exactly as it does today, as it did yesterday before we started getting very, very excited about the VR and AR space. So we've got to put some context around it of how we're going to use it and understand what we're using it for and what business problems it's helping you to solve. So one of the reasons we're looking at VR and AR is like there's the other question as well, which you've probably heard, which is like, is this the next 3D television? You know, is VR going to suddenly you know, explode into a supernova and then collapse into a black hole, uh, the same way that 3D TV did? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, the slightly longer answer is heck no. Um, so we've got content, we've got development, we've got people embracing VR, we've got people really looking more at the longer terms of, of where VR is going. And 3D TV really died because there wasn't the content to go with it and you couldn't take your glasses to other people's houses and interact with them. We're now getting things in collaboration across headsets, across different types of headset, so you're not locked into one infrastructure, and we're seeing that market steadily climb. Any analyst you talk to, they come out with different numbers, but we can all be assured that the fact that the market is going to be big. Right? So some of the numbers there by 2025, people looking at where the headsets are going, there's going to be an 80 billion market, 216 million headsets. Right? And so consequently, we're really looking at that and how can we take people with us on that journey into VR. The other thing, when I talk to people and say, oh, I'm the director of VR and AR, they say, it must be great, you get to play games day in, day out. <laughs> Everybody associates VR and AR outside of our community, shall we say, with the fact of playing games, media and entertainment, 360 video, uh, just being entertained in your own home. It's clearly not the case as we move forward. As we start to see VR and AR, which effectively are two points on the same line. You know, people try and say, oh, VR is this and AR is this. I think it's a progression as we go towards it. Uh, we saw it on um, Jay's graph earlier in the Deloitte presentation where you had the, the Gartner curve and we saw things actually progressing up there where Augmented reality is about 18 months to two years, I would hazard a guess, behind where VR is in terms of adoption. But we're going to see that steadily accelerate, and AR becomes much more of a commercial play than it really does as a home, so there's an inflection point. And because of those headsets, we're now seeing that there's going to be more of a, of a shift 
in the mix from predominantly media and entertainment today to actually becoming more and more industrial, 35.5% according to this uh, chart here. Healthcare, incredibly interesting. I've got a couple of examples uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, but healthcare is really becoming uh, a VR and AR haven. You know, we're, we're seeing developments there where there's um, a lot smarter people than I am, uh, of which apparently there's quite a lot, uh, who are actually doing work inside of healthcare to really drive human betterment. And that to me is really exciting. We're effectively taking what is a consumer headset today and actually making it work in a commercial and a healthcare environment for the betterment of humankind. It's, it's really, really fascinating. And then you've got the other areas like edu education, etc., with other, other reasons to take children and um, university graduates, whatever else, into different realms. And learning through experience is far more effective than learning through reading and listening. So we're seeing, hopefully, a better educated society moving forward because of some of the advancements we've had today. So you can really point to a lot of different industries and you can see usage cases in VR in every single one of them. We can see different trends, different usages. Uh, some of the obvious ones we've already had presentations on through today. Uh, one of the ones I wish I'd had when I actually moved to Raleigh was I looked at 35 different houses and then bought the 36th one. If I could actually have had a VR realtor app where I could have walked through the house and found out that the photograph of what looked like a great hall was actually a broom cupboard, but the photographer was talented, right? it would have saved me a lot of time from actually making that choice. So we're seeing some of the uh, simpler tasks really starting to embrace VR in different ways. Now, we have what we call verticals um, when we address businesses in, inside of Dell. And yeah, we've got oil and gas, media and entertainment, engineering and manufacturing, and healthcare as being the major ones. Uh, and we're seeing, again, different use cases really emerging. Again, the presentation just previously, architecture, obviously a key one. Uh, getting an emotional buy-in, you've probably heard it all before, that you, know, you put somebody into a headset, you show them a product, they get that emotional buy-in, and it's a shorter time to monetization, and they get an emotional connection with the product. You start putting that into architecture terms and you can actually say, this is going to be your building, this is how you're going to walk around. Oh, you want to move, add and change that? Absolutely fine. You don't have the change orders, change orders can be expensive, and you're doing all of this before you've cut ground. So architecture, obvious one. Oil and gas, they're really starting to embrace it as well. I naively thought that the training of oil and gas workers was you put a lot of people into a bus, you took them to an oil rig, six months later anybody that's still alive has got the job. Right? Apparently they don't do that. Um, so now we can train people inside of oil and gas and we can start building that muscle memory. We can put them in different environments and we can even, as we'll see in a moment, start to connect different sensors and start to do a mixed reality because if you're doing a training simulator and it's got a valve in there, then it would be a great idea, wouldn't it, to actually have that simulation with the oil and gas rig, you've got the valve there, you go along to turn it and then rather than frantically waving your wands above it, you actually know how much force it takes to turn that valve. Right? So again, you've trained that muscle memory inside of that. And oil and gas are doing a lot in mixed reality in terms of doing that. So they've actually got physical props in there to get that. Uh, if an emergency situation arrives and seconds count, then they can do that. Uh, engineering and manufacturing, so again I've got a case study in a moment which I'll mention where we've seen them using it through the design cycle and through the launch cycle. And then also in healthcare, uh, one there which uh, again I've got some examples on, but the first 360 video of an operation was done in London, I think it was about 12, 18 months ago, as a, as a training exercise so people can actually see the inside of an operating theatre and a surgeon at work so they can really experience what goes on inside of there without having to contaminate the environment with everybody piling in around the body. So yeah, it, it's a lot easier to do training by using VR in those types of environments. So one of the things I was really lucky to be involved in was uh, we did a launch with Jaguar Land Rover. So Jaguar Land Rover last November before the LA Motor Show were actually launching the iPACE concept vehicle. It was an electric car, uh, electric SUV, and they wanted to do something new and exciting for the journalists to really complement the future looking of the vehicle that they were about to launch. So we worked with um, a couple of studios in, in London to design and build the VR experience. 
66 people in the same VR experience, some of which were in London, some of which were in LA, all simultaneous, and you could actually see each other across the globe. And then the chief engineers and designers were beamed in via um, black screen, and you had them talking you through the vehicle and whatever else. And you could actually have your own personal VR experience with the car. You could rotate, zoom in, see different parts, explode it apart, and culminated with you appearing on Venice Beach inside the car right, and having your own personal experience in that. The journalists absolutely loved it. It was the first VR, world's first VR launch of a motor vehicle and really got some good press and some good feedback. And the general feedback was much more interesting than a PowerPoint presentation. Right, so it was a, a great experience that we had there. The second one that we're involved in is uh, this gentleman who's uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo from the University of Southern California. Uh, he's doing a lot of work with Project Brave Mind, which is veterans who have seen active service returning with PTSD and then treating PTSD using VR techniques right, through exposure therapy. Also helping um, autistic uh, people who are going for job interviews, putting them into different scenarios through VR so they know what to expect and how to react. Right, really touches on that healthcare aspect and the betterment of humankind. Some great work going on there and proud to be involved with that. And then what's really happening is we've got the, the gamification or gamification, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, of commercial. We've got all these techniques. It's been true for a very, very long time. Inside of gaming, uh, you always had the newest processors, the fastest processors, the new chipsets all coming through because people and consumers want new, better, faster. They're not really interested in the things in business about stability, longevity of parts, three-year life cycles, manageability, image management, all the mundane things we have to do inside the commercial area. But what we're seeing now is there's a real acceleration of things that are happening inside of games coming into commercial. We partnered with First Contact with a game called ROM Extraction. Uh, we did it at um, another event earlier on this year where we green screened it and people who are watching somebody inside of VR are basically watching them flail around and it's not that interesting once you've got over the first five minutes of laughing at them because they just look ridiculous. Right? But Inside of this now, we can actually put somebody inside the game and the viewers can then see that person from an over-the-shoulder third-person perspective of what they're doing inside of that game. So there's more involvement from the audience. And we're now seeing those techniques actually coming into training and whatever else in the commercial side to get more involved training, more realistic training, and really involving the audience a lot more. And then some of the technological advancements around tracking. In this instance, it was tracking the gun. But we can now track other things in a physical environment and bring those into a VR world as well for that gamification of training inside that commercial environment. So the last bit I'm going to do is I'm just going to tee up a video here, which is a partnership we've done with Meta. Uh, how many of you have seen Meta on the show floor? Yeah? So uh, Meta are down there. We partnered with them. We partnered with Ultra Haptics uh, and also Nike. And we put something together about how Nike is looking at the future of product development and how we can take these new technologies in <coughs> VR and AR and really help the design process and help designers to realize their creations a lot quicker. So just please indulge me on this one. It starts with a question. Load women size eight. Followed by an idea on how to make things simpler, better, or more beautiful. Approximate shape from sketches. But it's not just what it looks like. Load cross-terrain sequence. It's how it works. Which means trying. And failing. And trying again. To be a designer means not being bound by the limits of your tools. But instead, Expand box. Being inspired by them. Show me the upper. So that you can focus on what only you can do. Being creative.
being curious. And being critical. Exploring the union between function and form. Until suddenly you know. Optimize cushion pattern for terrain. That's it. And when you're ready to share your work, make sure everyone can see that the world is a little simpler, better, and more beautiful. And with that, thank you very much.